I hope that today's lecture, when it is uh, completed, we may have some time for a few questions, clarifications, uh, which the speaker has agreed to deliver, time permitting. This is I would now request Sri Jag Mohan to resume his lecture and deliver the second part of his lecture on the challenge of the cities. Our cities have been ravaged by a number of forces. But the most grievous injury has been caused by speculators and manipulators of urban lands. Theirs is the unkindest cut of all. Any scheme for restructuring or redesigning our cities will not yield the desired results unless the urban lands, especially those earmarked for future development, are owned by public authorities. Comprehensive planning is a popular term with our planners, but hardly anyone realizes that comprehensive planning without comprehensive control over land is not possible. Edward Carton, author of the well-known book, The Future of London, observes most of the greatest achievements of urban planning in any city, anywhere in the civilized world, have been where one authority has had complete control of the city's land, or at least of large enough areas to make comprehensive development possible. This is Urban land is a valuable recording. resource, and it must be ensured that full benefits of the infrastructural investment made by the public authorities are reaped by them. And the surpluses utilized for creating socially balanced and environmentally healthy communities. For no other form of property, says J.K. Galbraith, is the case for public ownership as strong as in the case of urban lands. It is the commanding heights on which, more than anything else, the quality of future development depends. In the conditions prevailing in our country, indirect control on urban lands, either through taxation or sealing on the holding, has been found to be cumbersome, inefficient, and counterproductive. It causes a great deal of hardship to comparatively resourceless, and at the same time, permits circumvention by the rich and the powerful, thereby giving rise to additional distortions. Take, for instance, the Urban Land Sealing and Regulation Act, 1976. It was designed to serve three objectives, imposition of sealing on the vacant land holding, limitation on the size of the dwelling to be constructed, this is regulation of transfer of urban property. None of these objectives have been realized. The excess vacant land to the extent of about 3 lakh hectares is believed to be available in the urban agglomerations. The land so far acquired is only about 4,000 hectares. On the other hand, the legislation has merely resulted in increased litigation 
and administrative costs and blocking of lands fit for development. In Greater Bombay, about 20,000 hectares of surplus land is estimated to be lying unutilized. A survey of land use pattern in cities with a population between 1 lakh and 10 lakhs has revealed that about 11 to 20 percent of the developed area in these cities is lying vacant and 37 to 48 percent of the uh, total area is lying undeveloped. Economic prosperity, social justice, efficient special patterns, healthy environment, and ecological balance cannot be secured without effective stewardship of public authorities over urban lands. A study of the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs confirms this view. It says, the demand for urban land is growing, yet the surplus is both genuinely and artificially limited. Radio the situation radically increases land costs and in turn consumes scarce investment capital better used elsewhere. It also irrationally distorts patterns of urban growth and development. As urban infrastructure becomes more costly and inefficient in institutions and facilities fail to provide adequate services to their population. Urban, social and economic imbalances and injustices are intensified and the quality of the total urban development erodes. The only effective method at the present stage of our social development is to bring about direct control over urban lands. All the lands needed for future expansion of the city or redevelopment of the older parts should be acquired by a simple legislative procedure and brought under public ownership. Such lands, after full or partial development, should be leased to the individuals and institutions in accordance with the town planning principles and requirements of social and economic justice. This approach has many advantages. It is simple to understand and implement. It facilitates distribution in accordance with the needs of different sections of the community. It equalizes the impact of planning this is all on the erstwhile landowners as everyone gets compensation on the same principles, irrespective of the use prescribed under the city plans. It safeguards the future and secures long-term planning objectives. It prevents hoarding and speculation, thereby accelerating the process of development and increasing real availability. <coughs> Daily's experience illustrates the usefulness of this approach. Here, large-scale acquisition of land was resorted to with the threefold objectives of regulating development, providing social justice, and raising resources from within the city by ensuring that the benefits of investment made by public authorities in public utilities and other infrastructures accrue to them. All lands falling within the urbanizable limits of the master plan 1962 to 82 were notified for acquisition under Section 4 of the Land Acquisition Act. Simultaneously, a revolving fund of rupees 5 crores 
subsequently augmented to rupees 12 crores was provided. The program of acquisition, development, and disposal was so designed that about 48,000 acres of land was acquired and seed capital of rupees 12 crores revolved to the extent of <coughs> rupees 265 is crores. That is 22 times its original size. This approach has also resulted in providing social goods to the public on a sufficiently large scale. Through the agency of the DDA, about 8,000 hectares of land have been developed as green, comprising 52 city forests, 750 parks, and 68 lakh trees. About 1.5 lakh houses have been constructed are under construction in addition to the housing units created in about 70,000 plots made available to the public through the general sale or through cooperative societies. Another 1.070 lakhs household units are being made available through Rohini scheme. Compare the development of Delhi with that of Calcutta or Bombay, or for that matter, any metropolitan town of the developing countries, the comparison would speak for itself. Whatever success has been achieved in Delhi in regard to the provision of social goods has largely been due to its acquisition policy. And whatever failures it has encountered are largely attributable to the obstacles created in the acquisition and disposal of land by vested interests and by the out of tune legal and institutional framework. This is All India Radio. Archives Advanced Department. acquisition of land, our creation of land bank is strongly opposed by a lobby which poses as friends of farmers and cultivators. It is usually argued on their behalf that their lands are acquired at low price and subsequently disposed at higher price. Prema Fshai, the argument is appealing, but it cannot stand the test of closer scrutiny. The high prices to which the reference is made usually pertain to a small percentage of the total land acquired. For instance, in Delhi, excluding commercial areas, not more than 1% of the total land acquired has been put to auction. Yet the impression created is that all lands are sold at fabulous prices. About 10,000 acres of land which has been paid for at the market value as determined by the courts has been kept green and is seldom spoken of. Criticism of acquisition also misses the vital point that urban lands at reasonable prices are acquired largely for the rural population which moves into the cities as migrants. It is the lobby of the speculators that causes misunderstanding. Experience shows that the land at the periphery of the city or the land likely to be urbanized hardly remains with the cultivators or farmers. These lands pass into the hands of urban speculators who buy land from the farmers at what seems to be an attractive price but is nothing compared to the price at which the speculator or private developer would sell. By the very nature of his operation, the private developer 
does not bother about the future or about the socially most efficient form of urban development. He is not keen to provide urban services and looks merely to the area under his ownership. His clientele is also limited to high income group or upper middle income group. And damage is compounded by the fact that in our cities, most transactions of this nature take place in black market. In this process, both the farmer and the city developing authorities suffer. The urban poor are totally neglected. A sound and just approach is to absorb the farmers and the cultivators in the process of urban development, which is highly employment generative. It is estimated that even if 10 to 15 percent of the employment created by the process of urban development is reserved for the erstwhile landowners and cultivators this is and their dependents, and at least one residential plot or flat is allotted to them at fixed price, they would be fully absorbed in the new opportunities and would be better off than in the erstwhile profession. In this advocacy of acquisition of land and freezing of land values at a given time, no ideology is involved. It is a practical necessity for our cities. Both Hong Kong and Malaysia have resorted to a large scale acquisition of land. There is hardly any development authority in the world which enjoys as much power as Malaysia Development Authority. It can acquire land or any other right connected with land or building complexes. A sound urban land policy must be accompanied by an equally sound policy towards housing, which is the acutest problem of a metropolitan city. In fact, as observed by Lakar Bouzier, about 60 years ago, the problem of the house is the problem of the epoch. The equilibrium of the society depends upon it. If human welfare is our objective, observed Pandit Nehru, it is bound up with the house. We must understand the limited option within which we have to work at least for a generation or two. We must recognize this is that we have problems not of housing in the conventional sense, but of shelter. Not of comfortable or luxurious living, but of roof over the head. Not of having spacious colonies, but of avoiding extreme congestion and creating an atmosphere in which personality is not stifled. The current emphasis in our cities is mainly on low cost construction for the low income groups alone. This emphasis need to be changed. There must be low cost housing for all and not only for the few. Low cost housing is called for not only to match the income and the construction costs, but also to save the scarce resources of capital and material. The common man's instinct to save for house should be exploited and additional resources untapped hitherto should be mobilized to construct houses. Even a poor man has a scope for saving. By holding promise of allotment of a house, marginal, marginal savings should be mocked and seed capital created 
for initiating public housing programs. Allotment on higher purchase basis should also instill a habit of forced saving and set in deflationary tendencies in the economy. To conserve land and other resources, group housing should be encouraged by the public authorities. This system of this construction has a number of social and economic benefits. The individual is saved of the botheration of constructing a house. Simultaneous allotment of flats in large housing estates brings immediate life to the community. Running of the bus services, schools and other community facilities become viable. Investment in infrastructure begins to yield full results. The group housing schemes should aim at constructing simple, inexpensive, functionally utilitarian, and aesthetically satisfying houses. It should make available a large number of green community areas and keep balance between the dictates of economy and of healthy environment. All institutional finance should be channelized through essential agencies like HUDCO or its subsidiaries, and loans should be advanced to state housing boards or developing authorities or housing cooperatives or individuals only if components of forced marginal saving is inbuilt in the project and overall interest of national housing policies are served. It is neither feasible nor desirable to stop the process of migration. Only an excessive rush is to be avoided. In fact, the cities have got to be prepared to absorb the migrants. This is All India Radio More planned and purposive, the process of urbanization, process of absorption, the better it would be for the migrant and the city. Henceforth, we should have only migrants' colonies and not squatters' colonies. Predetermined sites with basic civic amenities should be earmarked and developed in advance for those who migrate to the cities. And no one should be allowed to squat in a haphazard manner at any place. The city's annual budget must provide for the development of the sites equivalent to the number of the migrants. The small shelter units put up on the sites will acquire dignity and charm of their own if a healthy environment is provided to them. The emphasis should therefore be on the provision of community facilities, cheap transport, water supply, and sewerage, and a drainage system. It is in this field that knowledge of modern science and technology need to be applied to make available the basic amenities at minimum cost. What is, in fact, needed is an entirely new system of community services, a new community latrine, easy to clean and maintain, a new kitchen which can provide cheap and clean food to hundreds of people in a short time, and a new system of disposal of waste and maintenance of other services. This is all India it is seldom realized reporting. that migrants' colonies can be a blessing in disguise. Through them, we could bring about a peaceful social revolution and improve the productivity of the nation. By concentrating efforts on these, in the, on these colonies, we could at one stroke eliminate superstition and conservatism
from a large number of people, give new values to them, and raise the general capacity to live and enjoy a meaningful life. The shacks of despair and darkness could thus be converted into the shacks of hope and light. The slum dwellers who are squatting at unsuitable sites should be relocated. Romanticizing about the spontaneity of squatter settlement or their location near the supposed place of work usually ignores the hard realities and the miseries that are bred in these settlements due to congestion and insanitary conditions. It also sidetracks the issue that a large number of settlements are located at sites which are wholly unsuitable for human habitation and on which infrastructural investment is not feasible. Sometimes, in the name of human considerations, worst form of inhumanity is perpetuated. Let me illustrate by the case of clearance come resettlement operations carried out in Delhi recording. in 1976. Before the operation, there were about 1,400 haphazard ill planned clusters scattered all over the city in unsuitable and unhealthy sites. Contrary to general impression, 78% of the squatter household were living beyond 6.5 kilometers of the center of the city. About 72% of these 1,400 settlements had no water taps. 58% had no hand pumps. 69% had no lavatory seats. 65% no brick payment or pakka streets. 69% no stormwater drain. And 63% no street lighting. With extreme congestion and irregular and shapeless structures, with only 4% of pakka shacks, with unsuitable families and low sex ratio, 730 females to 1,000 meals. The environmental degradation could not be worse. It is from these subhuman conditions that the squatters were relieved and accommodated in 27 resettlement colonies. In a year, about 1,000, 1,45,000 residential and 10,000 shop plots were developed, and 200 kilometers of main drain, this is all 400 the kilometers of, of metal recording. road, and 14,000 permanent laboratory seats were constructed. About 500 parks were developed, besides planting five lakh trees. 10 new higher secondary schools buildings, 23 dispensaries, 60 TV sheds, were also constructed beside providing numerous other community facilities. As compared to almost 10% construction in pre-resettlement sites, the resettlement colonies were planned and developed only with 32% of the area as residential. 13% was earmarked for metal roads. 15% for paths, 16% for parks, 4% for shops, and 20% for other community facilities. Even otherwise, the concept of spontaneity will have little relevance if the migrants are allowed to go to the specific sites chosen beforehand. For instance, if in accordance with the master plan of a city, an area is earmarked for commercial and industrial development, the migrant colony 
should be set up near that area or in an area where informal sector of economy could grow with scope for ultimate absorption in the formal sector. In a rapidly expanding metropolis, there is no reason why employment opportunities should remain concentrated in a few areas. A well-conceived city plan should make recorded. dispersal of population and dispersal of employment opportunities an integral part of its overall strategy. Those who talk about the spontaneity theory do not care to answer the basic question, will haphazard and disorganized squatting with consequent wastage of resources help anyone? Will the general environment, environmental degradation be in the interest of squatters' health and happiness? Will general degradation not lower the overall economic productivity of the city? In a migrant or resettlement colony, we should evolve a new pattern of settlement, a settlement which gives priority to provision of fresh air, light, pure water, drainage, and greenery, which is simple but well organized, and which narrows the gap between the urban and the rural living. It should provide rudimentary shelter at ultra low cost. To begin with, even mud huts with thatched roofing should be encouraged. For those who are unemployed or underemployed, a work periphery should be provided and arrangements for importing rudimentary skills made. Sizable community kitchens community bath and community waste disposal system with simple arrangements for recycling should be set up. Cleanliness and civic management of these migrants' reporting. colonies should be entrusted to about five or seven elected persons from amongst the migrants. They should be assisted by two or three full or part-time municipal officers. For all this, however, a high degree of technological adaptation will be necessary. There are slums and squatter settlements where permanent rehabilitation is feasible. This rehabilitation should be accompanied by early conferment of property rights and upgradation of the settlements by provision of environmental facilities. We seem to have adopted an attitude of throwing old and historic portions of our cities into the dustbin of history. This is hardly wise. In this regard, it may well be remember, it may well, it may be well to remember that even a revolutionary like Lenin had this advice to give. Fellow citizens, do not touch even one stone, the old building, articles, document. All this is your history, your pride. Referring to the demands of old Paris, Balzac had said, but ah, Paris, you who has not stopped in admiration of your dark passages, before blind alleys, deep and silent, he who has not heard your murmur between midnight and two in the morning does not this know your true poetry, nor your strange and vast antithesis. The old and historic portions of our cities, too, have their own charm, their own way of life, and their own vast and strange antithesis. We must preserve their architectural and cultural heritage. They are like valuable pieces of art that need to be handled 
with a great deal of care and imagination. They should be saved not only from the misguided enthusiasm of modernity, but also from the pressure of speculators and profiteers. Real regeneration of historic centers does not only mean revival. It, in fact, involves the rejection of what is cruel and clumsy in the past, preservation of what is beautiful and healthy, and refashioning something that is new, something that is relevant to the present and a forerunner of the future. We must preserve the historic character of the old cities, not only by preserving their monumental buildings, but also their skyline, their street pattern, their way of life, their ease and elegance, their balance and harmony, and their social compactness and cohesion. We must, at the same time, heal the wounds which history has inflicted upon them. We must stimulate them intellectually and create in their narrow lanes and by lanes a new culture which widens the horizons of the mind and lights this is all India Radio the path for reform and regeneration. Ahmedabad is one Indian city which has undergone comparatively smooth change from the old to the modern city. In the 20th century, Ahmedabad has expanded far beyond the area formerly enclosed with the wall. But the planned outlay suburbs were inhabited by people whose family already had houses in the old city. And characteristically, they were planned on cooperative enterprises. Ahmedabad remains true to its past, a city of orthogenetic change. While it is necessary that the doors of the metropolitan cities should not be closed to the migrants, there are obvious limitations to the policy of absorption. To keep the flow of the migration, migrants into metropolitan cities to a manageable proportion, it is necessary to simultaneously adopt a policy of distribution of population amongst the villages, small and medium-sized towns, and metropolitan cities. It is time that we realize importance of special planning, comprehend its numerous advantages, work out its minutest details, provide framework for its effective implementation, change our laws in traditional and sectarian, sectarian approach, and make it a sharp and befitting instrument for not only reshaping the structure and life of our cities, but also for attaining balance and harmonious growth for the nation as a whole. This is All India Radio Archives We reporting. must plan and develop small and medium-sized towns to serve, on the one hand, as economic and social links between the villages, and to prevent, on the other, a rush to metropolitan centers. These small-sized towns could be nucleus for agro-industrial growth in our country. The enterprising farmers are now keen to modernize agriculture. They are now buying tractors and other sophisticated machinery for improving agriculture techniques, for upkeep, maintenance, and repair of the machinery. It is necessary to have small-sized towns which could serve, on average, 50 to 75 villages. The economies of scale would not prevent location of repair and maintenance workshop and other service industries in the villages. At the same time, the facilities for repair and service industries cannot be too far away. Again, the farmers with the newly acquired wealth from Green Revolution would like to improve their standard of living by purchasing consumer goods such as radios, scooters, motorcycles, 
and building new houses. For this purpose, the small size town could serve as a good market where the educated and enterprising villagers could also find jobs. They could stay in the town, which besides providing agriculture supplies like fertilizers, seeds, insecticides, pumps and other farm tools would also afford modern urban facilities in the shape of cinemas, libraries, hospitals, theaters, shopping centers and the like. These facilities could afford, these facilities could fulfill their urban urges and help in the healthy growth of their personality. At the same time, such educated persons would not be far away from the villages and could remain in touch with them. Their newly acquired rationality, sharpened by living in urban environments, could serve as an instrument of further economic and social change in the villages and attainment of higher productivity, which in turn could place more money in the hands of the farmer and create new demands and lead to further growth of the markets in the town. <coughs> Above the level of the small town, medium-sized town should be developed to meet urban demands of higher order. Such towns could be established by a sound locational policy. Here, keeping in view the economies of scale, market conditions, potential for growth, suitable industries could be established and necessary infrastructure created. The medium-sized town will be feeding centers of the small towns and provide for those goods and services which it would not be possible for the later to do. The medium-sized towns could be thriving centers of industry and commerce, of local art and culture, and of education and research. They could develop this civic pride and community and social recording. organization of their own. They might even nurse a healthy contempt for the metropolitan cities whose life, nevertheless, they could taste occasionally and, and from whose foundation, fountainhead, they could draw latest knowledge and technique and pick up new threads. What I visualize is three tiers of urban centers, small town, medium-sized town, and metropolitan centers. To the mode of selection, I would come later. Suffice to say, on an average, 50 to 75 villages might be covered by one small town, and five to 10 small towns by one medium-sized town. Here, I would like to make it clear that small or medium-sized towns would be woven in the physical, social, and economic fabric of the region. Experience of the British new towns and Delhi's ring towns shows that the concept of satellite towns has to a large extent failed to deflect the pressure of population to the metropolitan city because these towns were never effectively linked with the countryside and the region as a whole. The advantage of the framework which I have portrayed above are numerous. It will keep the metropolitan center within the manageable limits, prevent decay of small and medium-sized towns, keep the educated and enterprising youth near the village, impart further potency this and depth to the green revolution, facilitate exploitation of local resources to the full, help in growth and improvement of indigenous and local techniques, and give a broader base to our culture and civilization. It will also promote agropolitan development and coupled with the technological innovations could help in the evolutions of cities in the field. 
it needs to be made clear the deliberation promote the deliberate promotion of growth centers as an instrument of rational rural planning has been tried in countries like Bulgaria, Poland, France, and West Germany. The experience of these countries is that growth policy takes advantage of two facts. The fact that in the development process, certain kinds of concentrations or agglomerations bring economies of scale, and the fact that the development viewed as a process of innovation as well as growth does not appear everywhere at the same time, but manifests itself <laughs> as favored points, from which, depending upon the circumstances, it tends to propagate outside. If the concept of the growth center has been implemented successfully, though in a different context, in countries like Bulgaria, Poland, France, and West Germany, there is no reason why we should not be able to do so with greater degree of success. In fact, in our case, there is need to amplify the concept and make it more broad-based on the lines just above, particularly because we cannot afford to not to reap full advantage of the Green Revolution. In this connection, it may be pointed out that at present, we have only about 2,000 market towns against the need of about 12,000 such towns to give proper marketing facilities to our 5,75,936 villages. A new settlement pattern revolving around a cluster of villages is already emerging in areas where impact of development and progress in the field of education, health, and transport has been felt. These areas include the Sugar Belt of Maharashtra, Coastal Belt of Andhra Pradesh, Western and Southern District of Kerala, and whole of Punjab and Gujarat, Southeastern part of Madhya Pradesh, and Central and Southern parts of Bihar, and Western part of Uttar Pradesh and some pockets in Tamil Nadu. I have no doubt that what I have stated above is in theory sound and logical, but the real test lies in transplanting this concept into practice. To spot out correctly the small and medium-sized towns with proper growth potential and to provide institutional framework for creating necessary infrastructure to facilitate development of these towns should involve highest form of sound and objective judgment, free from political bias and local pressures. The type of machinery which I would recommend for undertaking this, this task is, is independent statutory regional boards. Our local and state leaders must be persuaded to subordinate narrow loyalties to the overriding interest of the nation. Herein lies the challenge to the central leadership. It has to persuade the state governments to help in formulating and implementing special policies through the agencies of independent regional boards. These boards would select on purely planning and scientific consideration the growth points the small-sized towns and the medium-sized towns, and coordinate and control the planning as well as implementing process with funds and budget of their own. If, however, in the beginning, it is not possible to entrust the detailed implementation of the project to such boards, at least the selection of the growth points and the manner in which necessary infrastructures may be created should be left to them. In this regard, the board should be assisted by economic and geographic planners, statisticians, sociologists, experts in other fields, administrators, and local leaders. The centrally sponsored scheme 
for integrated development of small and medium-sized towns has so far failed primarily because no precise institutional basis has been provided for it. Technological innovation can play a revolutionary part in shaping the future of our cities. In a sense, the challenge before our city is technological. So far, not much thought has been given to the human settlement technology, a technology specially designed to solve the problems connected with our human settlements, such as problems of improving and managing the civic services, of constructing inexpensive houses and roads, and of conserving energy and recycling waste, and developing special water and waste technologies. There is no reason why India should not be able to evolve its own technological devices to solve the problem of its cities and give them a new shape and form. India, with its vast technical manpower and scientific skill, is capable of technological innovations. Only a sense of direction and purpose is required. Let us, for example, take the case of a resettlement colony or a deprived area or a slum. Two of the basic environmental problems of such areas are disposal of human waste and use of charcoal energy. All cooking is done through inferior quality of wood and coal. This causes, this causes nuisance of smoke, which is highly injurious to health. If a technology could be developed by which human waste is converted into energy and supplied through a simple pipe to the dwelling of the resettlers, <coughs> the problem of waste disposal and the problem of meeting energy needs could be simultaneously solved. A huge liability would thus be converted into a valuable asset this is all and the quality of life recording. improved radically. Another example is the construction of inexpensive houses with mud or with sun-dried mud bricks and thatched roofing treated with special chemical solution to make them rain and fire resistant. By using a suitable mix of appropriate architectural elements, structural techniques, Stabilization measures and care in siting, mud building can be successfully built in almost all types of climatic regions and with proper care and maintenance, they should last for decades. The waste disposal technology is another field in which burdensome liabilities such as sewage, sludge, night soil, agriculture and other waste could be converted into valuable assets. Netherlands, for example, is recovering each year about 200 million tons of compost from municipal waste. There is no reason why, by inappropriate human settlement technologies, our cities should not recover almost their entire waste. Our cities also suffer from the problems emanating from the industrial waste. In this case, too, appropriate human settlement technology could help. Recycling of industrial waste is absolute feasible with low-cost, labor-intensive techniques. For instance, in Shanghai, Chinese recover from the industrial waste in a year about 8,000 tons of oil, 10,000 tons of metal, 200,000 tons of cement slabs and thousands of tons of processed waste all which fertilizes about 6,650 acres of farmland. This type of human settlement technology will be of special help in setting up of economically productive and environmentally clean migrant colony. Through technological innovations, these colonies could produce their own energy, construct their own shelter units, 
set up their own workplaces and also operate on a human scale. For day-to-day -day needs, they could be self-supporting and self-sustaining and yet linked with the overall network of the metropolitan life. The development of special human settlement technology does not mean that high technology should be abundant or given lower priority, as is made out in certain quarters. By acquiring latest scientific and technological techniques, we can not only remain in competition with the world, but also bring about suitable changes in the seat in the, re in the settlement patterns that are currently taking place. For instance, satellite technology and the technology of telecommunication could help in providing a number of facilities in the villages and small towns, thereby making them more attractive and reducing the pressure of movement to the metropolitan cities. Some sections of the opinion are afraid of high technology. They have in their mind fixation of technological development as it took place in the West in a particular this historical context. This was largely a technology of exploitation, a technology for the few at the expense of many, a technology that uses the colonial city for drying out its wealth a technology that was rooted in the demands of capitalism and imperialism. Parsi, high technology is not evil, as is made out in some quarters. It is only to be adapted to meet our needs, new social and economic requirements. Japan is an excellent example of technological innovations. The quality of life in the Japanese cities and villages has radically improved without sacrificing any of the gains of the economic development. The framework of our urban institutions and urban laws need to be re-examined in depth. Our corporations and municipalities are still structured on the 19th century idea of Lord Ripon with local contact and local knowledge. These ideas may be useful for managing the day-to-day -day civic affairs, but they cannot meet the challenge of planning and managing huge metropolitan areas. Local contacts nurse local vested interests, and they prove a hindrance rather than a help in managing metropolitan towns. New vision is required. Strong will is required. New avenues need to be explored and new resources 